you mentioned menopause. You did a post on Instagram titled The Menopause Conundrum. Mm -hmm. And I have a quote from you here. You wrote, most individuals report an average of approximately one to two kilograms of fat gain each year, specifically in the midsection, yeah. but also report no other changes in activity or eating behaviors. I want to start by saying this perception is valid. So there's this common experience mm -hmm. where to the woman's knowledge, they haven't changed the way that they're eating. They haven't changed the way that they're moving their body, but they're piling on the weight, especially around the belly. And that, of course, is frustrating. Yeah. It can be frustrating. I understand that. Disheartening. Unpack this conundrum for us. What's happening here and what can someone do about it? Yeah. So what happens is when you go through menopause, you have this deep, this, you know, you have perimenopause is just this period of time of like very haphazard hormones. I think everyone's trying to balance their perimenopause hormones. And I'm like, well, the state is just dysregulated hormones because your body is kind of going through this phase where eventually your estrogen is is essentially like bottom line. You have very low estrogen and that loss of estrogen shifts a lot of things in your body that you experienced in your premenopausal state. And so one of the things that comes along with that is this shift to more central adiposity. You start to take on more of the fat distribution of males in this menopausal state. And so part of that is one, you have more belly fat in general. So a lot of people aren't necessarily gaining weight or fat, but it is shifting uh, to the midsection. So you have part of that where you're getting more of that menopause belly that people like to call it. And that is, that is real. That is happening. You're just reshifting the way. Cause you, you know, in the premenopausal state, you know, females tend to store more fat in their glutes and their hips and not as, or like their lower stomach a little bit, but not as much of that male pattern storage of that central body fat. And that's a positive and good thing because that is one of the reasons among others that we have reduced, you know, chronic disease risks and, um, you know, premenopausal, we have lower prevalence of cardiovascular and metabolic disease, but that decline in estrogen shifts to that central adiposity and does some other things. But what it does essentially is not only do you have more abdominal fat just in that area where you're seeing it, but you also have more visceral adipose tissue. And that's where it's more of an issue and more problematic and more worrisome because that's the adipose tissue that relates, relates to chronic disease and maybe potentially dysregulated metabolism or inflammation and all that stuff that leads to these things fatty liver disease, yes. type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And that's more of the hidden fat, but that is also in your abdomen. So you're kind of getting this increase, this shift of fat storage to the abdomen, and then this increase in visceral adipose tissue. And so like independent of any other changes, you might just shift your fat storage to your abdomen. And I know like I'm this premenopausal woman saying this, and trust me when I say like, I'm, I'm well prepared that I know it's going to happen one day before people are like, you don't, you don't know what it's like. And I'm like, I sympathize. I hear it all of the time. And so you have this, but you also have weight gain that is associated with a menopause transition. I think it's like five to 10 kilos on average is the reported weight gain of the menopause transition. Over what, a five to 10 year period? Yeah. During that, 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 that transition, that's like the average reported weight gain um, from, you know, females who are going through that. Yeah. Menopause, just depending on people, how long they go through it. And this is due to, I think, a variety of factors. And so the conundrum is that they say, I haven't changed anything. And to some degree, that isn't true. And then some degree, it is true. Or the changes are happening without their knowledge. So one of the things is like, it's not like your, your hormones play a role, but they aren't like changing the rules of everything else. Like, it's not like they're changing the rules entirely. And like things that didn't work for you premenopausal don't work for you, not necessarily because you need a whole different set of rules or a whole new game. It's that one, that decline in hormones means that your margin for error is lower. It also means that things are changing that are changing the way that you move and eat without you even recognizing that you're doing it. And so some of the things that we see are, one, you can't control the way your body's going to store fat, and that's unfortunate. And energy deficits and fat loss are the only way that you will actually- What about estrogen them. supplementation? So I actually don't know off the top of my head how much that that does change it. Because from my understanding that there is still weight gain, even with estrogen supplementation, it doesn't fully revert that fat gain from my understanding. Um, I think it does reduce some of the other symptomology or potentially effects of that chronic disease risk that we see from having that estrogen supplementation. But from my understanding, it doesn't fully revert 
um, some of that weight gain. Um, but what that might help with, though, and there's some preclinical studies that show, so one of the things that we think potentially impacts this shift in metabolism or weight gain is that there's less spontaneous physical activity. And there's there's been mouse model studies that have shown um, that when you take these, these rats that are overectomized and you give them estrogen versus no estrogen, they're more active when you add back the estrogen. And there's some early data, data in clinical trials with females that, you know, showed that when they were... So that you could do these ovarian suppression trials where you suppress premenopausal women and then, or even postmenopausal women, and then give them estrogen or other hormones back to like isolate the effects. And there's some suggestion that physical activity might be increased because of that exposure to estrogen. Or on the contrary, when you go through menopause, you might just be moving less and not realizing you're moving less. Like that spontaneous daily physical activity is potentially reduced without you saying, well, I haven't changed my exercise behavior habits, but you might be more fatigued or less aware of the fact that you're not doing this general daily activity. Like how many times a day do you get up off the couch and walk to the other side of the room yes. or reaching for things, mm-hmm. yeah. move, movement that you're not conscious of? Yeah, that that need or that daily activity of like movement or steps or things like that. And so you might not be aware of the fact that you're moving less because you're per- we're not really good at perceiving what we're actually doing unless we're kind of monitoring, assessing it, and managing that. But so one of the things that I usually recommend there is like, I think that's where like steps can be helpful for assessing how active am I actually being or controlling that controllable. I don't, tracking your steps and hitting step targets and going for walks isn't considered non, like neat. I think a lot of people misuse neat. Any intentional activity is a neat. Neat is that spontaneous activity that you don't realize or know that you're doing, right? All the energy I burned talking with my hands today versus sitting here like this. But if you know that that, is going to potentially drop yeah. off, then you can offset that with a little, little bit more intentional movement. Yes, and that doesn't have to be exercise. It can be just intentional. And that, and again, it doesn't even have to be, I mean, walking is just the easiest and most generic thing, but that can be cleaning your house, gardening, running errands. Like you might just be doing that stuff less or you can add that stuff in. It doesn't necessarily be, mean it be you have to be walking a million miles every single day to bring that back up or you become obsessed with that. But you might be like, you know, I used to walk 8,000 steps a day, but you know, I've been only walking two. And that's a good indication of like maybe, okay, you should just can bring that back up to the level that you're doing, or you can just control your controllables. You know that you can be more generally active across your days. And that's a good recommendation for all people is to break up their sitting more frequently and be active across the days. The step count doesn't need to be 10,000 steps, but just like moving more generally. So that's one thing that might be potentially happening where you don't even recognize that you're moving less or you're less active. And the next thing is, is that, you know, you do have this, that, that shifting of fat. And I know that's really hard for people, but you might end up having these shifts in your hunger and satiety and perception. And so there, there's this really cool study that I did mention in that post that I thought was a really interesting reframe of this idea of like, you, you have this, you're like, you're more, you're have decreased anabolic sensitivity. So essentially you're less prone to building and recovering muscle tissue, or you're not using protein necessarily as efficient as efficiently. And what happens though, you might also be on the, on simultaneously while this is happening is under eating protein. And so along with that, you might end up having this increased hunger to fill that protein need because your body needs more protein to meet the, the demands of what your body is asking for. But then because of our hyper palatable food environment, you might be, be indirectly eating to hunger and satiety with all of these carbs and fat foods, but not getting in that protein intake that you need. We also know that protein in general, like moderate to high protein diets really help regulate satiety. And they also help with body composition and they also are going to help with muscle building recovery. And so that protein intake in that peri and postmenopausal period becomes more important. It's not that it wasn't important before. It's that same thing. Margin of error is smaller. Like these things that were important become, the the importance of them becomes magnified. Have you seen Stephen Simpson and David Raubenheimer, their protein leverage hypothesis? Yeah, this is essentially this. Yes, yes, yes. So like the body, my understanding is our body is very sophisticated and Mm -hmm. it's kind of sensing these different nutrients. Yeah. There's a desire or appetite for protein. Mm -hmm. And it's a, that's a very strong appetite. Yeah. And what you're saying is if you're surrounding yourself with these hyperpalatable foods that are protein dilute, mm-hmm. but there are a lot of calories. Yes. Your body, the, the, the message that your body is getting is essentially, it's not enough protein here. Keep eating these. Yes. You'll overeat calories in order to you try, try to, to get pro- to yes. a certain amount mm-hmm. of protein. So, but you're that hungry. So you feel, okay, well, I'm eating to my 
to my hunger level, but you're eating all the things that aren't meeting that. To, it's exactly that. It's that protein, essentially that protein leverage theory and why that's more important because you also have this, this increased need for protein or you're less sensitive. To, you, you just, it's, it becomes more important because of that decline in estrogen. And so I think that you drive up that protein intake in the meals and foods. It's great for muscle health and it's also great for managing that satiety. But then because of that decreased sensitivity to protein and you're more catabolic, you're, you're breaking, you're more in a state of breaking down or not necessarily promoting muscle tissue growth, then you're decreasing or losing muscle tissue mass, which in turn decreases your metabolic rate. You become less metabolically sensitive. You're less insulin sensitive. You have less glucose disposal. Um, you're potentially producing less energy when you are being active, and then you're burning less calories, and you're also becoming less metabolically inefficient at the same time. Like Then that's kind of that insulin sense. Uh, insulin insensitivity and, you know, metabolic disease and going down that pathway of things. And so muscle is a large contributor to resting energy expenditure. And so you kind of have this dynamic of like you're moving less and you're not eating enough protein and you're losing muscle. So then you're not only gaining weight in your midsection, but you're also decomping. Your body composition is moving in a negative way where you're losing muscle and you're gaining or shifting fat centrally. And then I think a lot of, you know, females feel so frustrated because they're like, I didn't change anything. But sometimes it might be the fact that you didn't change anything might be causing that because you might have gotten away with more of those things pre-menopausal, but that margin for error is how I like to say it is, is, is smaller. So you almost have to be, and I don't want people to become like restrictive and obsession. That's never my message, but you might just have to be more dialed in on the things that you're doing. And also keep in mind that there's also the factor that Sleep is potentially negatively impacted with menopause, hot sweats, um, waking up in the middle of the night, things like that. Interrupted sleep from pets and children. I mean, most you know women during this phase of life have usually older children, and they still might be interrupting their sleep and things like this. But you know, you have potentially impacted sleep or poor sleep, or the quality becomes lower even at the same duration, and even in poor sleep itself impacts recovery and muscle recovery and and, and it increases your hunger drive to eat more. And then you're, you, you're not as energized to burn as much activity or move more. And then it kind of feeds into that loop of all these other things that are also happening in the body at the same time while that is happening. And so I think the other component of this too is that there's a lot of lifestyle factors that we see independent of menopause that happen with aging. People move less. They're less active. They have more responsibilities. They have more stress you know, maybe they're drinking more casually across the week and having these other lifestyle factors or behaviors that are factoring in, or they're just less strict or diligent or healthy within their diets, or they never, you know, I think there's a lot of people who they just, they, they stop being active at a certain point in their twenties and thirties, and they don't really worry about what they eat. And then when you get to that shift in your transition of your hormones, it catches up a little bit more like that, that magnitude of that catches up a little bit more. I also think society culture is changing a lot so mm -hmm. the women that are in menopause now grew up in a very different time and you yes. know, there would have been much less women in the gyms doing yes. resistance training mm -hmm. so that stimulus is a lot more foreign to mm -hmm. this sort of part of the population yeah and perhaps in 20 30 years we see a little bit of a different picture with you know women who are now in their 20s or 30s yeah. but are embracing resistance training. Yeah. Um, so I have to imagine that that resistance training piece for women who are currently in menopause is a little bit of a, a barrier. And yeah. there's probably a lot of women who are 50 or 60 and doing no resistance mm -hmm. training. Yeah, no, I mean, I can only hope in my lifetime. I mean, we've seen such an increased spike in interest in resistance training and good training in, in females, largely driven by the drive of booty gains, honestly, which I will let that <laughs> let that be the driver motivator. But I think that's why there's this confusion and frustration is because like, and especially this trendiness, just like the cycle training of menopause specific workout programs, because for many of these, these women, they never, they maybe ran or did cardio or walked, but they never did resistance training. So I will say for those of you who are listening, I think a lot of people, when I talk about, you know, training for, for women, they'll be like, well, does this count for menopause too? So everything I talked about resistance training earlier for you guys, it also applies to you. The same thing applies to you. Um, train with the intention of gaining muscle. Strength will come along with that. Um, I think that's the most important thing is to give yourself that stimulus or try to, to gain or preserve as much muscle as you can when you're in that phase of life. And 
it's not too late. I think that's the message they also need to be hearing is it's not it's not too late to start at any point in time. Um, but the other things when I think about that too that they don't do, which a lot of a lot of women don't do that have don't have a history of sports plyometrics that power training and that effort training i think i think everyone should do a little bit of athleticism type stuff in their training but like the two most important things for that transition if you're not doing them is to start doing them is is resistance training heavy resistance training and some sort of jump training it doesn't need to be like you don't need to go be doing triple box jumps you can be doing s- skips or pogo hops or single leg hops or like little things like that to start and then progress into more things um, further on but it's it's you need to start training intentionally with the idea of stressing and stimulating and preserving the power output of your muscles. You get the you get the bone mineral density benefits as and the, well. Yes, that too. Yeah, that that when we think about muscle, that's what we want to be preserving. But that's that's like one of the most important things too. And so, you know, bone mineral density peaks really early on in, in a female's lifespan. That's also why like eating enough for teen athletes or girls in their twenties and not being under eating is really important because you, you that is when you're like really maximizing that and that's build up the savings. You build up the savings of that, but that isn't to say. I mean, there is data in you know midlife women. That shows that doing plyometrics and or resistance training, it either potentially increases that or at least preserves it. What's plyometrics if someone's hearing that? Yeah, so time? plyometrics are jump. It's jumping training. Um, so plyometrics are really important for bone mineral density and in power output of muscles. But like the, the combination of the plyometrics with the with the strength training seems to be like the most ideal for bone mineral density, at least maintaining it or you know, potentially increasing it. And so it's it's just jump training. So it's essentially short, rapid jumping cycles of like max output. And you do a few reps, so maybe like something like three to 10 reps of something, and then you fully rest and recover. So it's things that are any sort of jumping, bounding, or leaping. And they scale from like lower intensity, moderate intensity, higher intensity. And so for most people listening to this, don't just start by doing like depth drops or high like rebound burpee broad jumps like start with skipping or double leg pogo hopping or you know like low box jumping and then move to something like maybe like lunge jumping or squat jumping or then maybe depth drops and high box jumps but like it doesn't even need to be like some of these programs are like just like people just hopping for like five sets of 10 every day or a few times a week. And that's what like some of these interventions were. And so that with the resistance training appears to be the most, one of the most beneficial combinations of training for, and again, I think that if if more females did that across their entire lifespan, they'd be better off. But if you haven't done it and you're at that period post-menopause transition, it's not even that it's menopause unique specific training. It's just like these are the tools of training that are highly effective in many people, but that become more important aren't shown to like help preserve the things that you are losing. Um, within that.